quantum physics doesn't make sense to me. Well, I've, I've tried. Yeah, I've tried really hard. It makes about the same sense as that definition yeah, you were just well, reading of entropy. Exactly. I'll go over it and over it again and get little chunks of it. Right. And, and I would understand like sections of sentences. Right. And then I'd have to try to put them together with the other sections. It's hard. It's yeah. tough stuff. But. One of the most important things, I think it was Niels Bohr who said this, I'm not quite sure, but one of the members of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics said that basically a particle exists in many states simultaneously, and it's not until it's measured that it collapses into one state. That's one of the basic principles of quantum physics. Well, guess what, Niels? Every particle is being measured in some way all the time, all of its life by other particles that are basically taking its measure and then responding. Essentially, nothing is isolated. Nothing is isolated in this particular cosmos. You were talking, I, I watched a video where you were talking about that there is essentially a universal brain. Well, yes, because you and I, right now, uh, we're going to be talking to possibly out of your 500, where it's, it's more like 1 million uh, total viewers and listeners. It's probably um, more than that. So I think it's probably closer to three. Yeah. So we're going to be talking <clears throat> to let's say a hundred thousand of them or two hundred thousand of them, um, and they're processing what we are saying right now. There are bacteria in your gut and mine who live in enormous colonies. An enormous bacterial colony. If you had it on the palm of your hand, it would be the size of your hand, but you couldn't see it. Are you are you thinking of this while you're saying it? Are you thinking of the vast numbers of people that are listening and watching? Or are you just relaying the information? Like, are you, are you cognizant? Yeah, both. Both. Because I want, remember, Einstein gave me my marching orders. Right. You have to take complex ideas and simplify them so much that anyone with a high school education and a reasonable degree of un intelligence can understand them. And I want to make good radio for your audience. But once you, what, what I'm trying to get at is once you have got it established in your head that nothing is isolated, that everything is connected, when you speak... Are you aware when you're speaking that everything is connected? I mean, are you are you actually consciously thinking of all of these different minds, taking into account all these different mind-blowing things that you're saying, and then applying them out in the world? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you hear it coming out of my mouth, that's what's churning around in my brain. I'm just you're you're such a bright guy. I'm just trying to understand if you are in the moment. Or if you're in the moment as well as being consciously aware of the spread of information. Well, that you're my a part obligation of. is to do both simultaneously. Both, both simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. That's my obligation. That's what I assumed. Yeah. <laughs> so at any rate, so the the entropic theory doesn't make any sense. The I mean, look, there I was in a bed, right? Right. So you would think I'm totally isolated. I'm not. You're not. I'm not. I mean, once upon a time I wrote an essay about Descartes. Well, Descartes came up with the idea of, I think, therefore I am. Um, he took a retreat in Amsterdam. He rented a second floor apartment, and he was trying to isolate himself the way that those particles are isolated with the Schrodinger's equation, the particles that were being drawn on napkins in Moscow. Um, and so that he could strip everything away and find out what was the most basic thing, the most basic axiom, the most basic thing we take for granted in life. And he came up with, I think, therefore I am. Now, think about this for a minute. While he was trying to think this out, he was kneading a, a rubbery gum eraser with which he erased his ink. He was sitting on the second floor, which means somebody had invented the architecture that he was sitting in and the concept of the floor and the concept of beams that go across from one wall to the other that were holding him up. He was looking out the window and he was looking at the hats that the Amsterdam men and women were wearing as they walked by, and he was fucking the cleaning lady whom he <laughs> made pregnant. So how isolated really was he? <laughs> the universal mind theory, this the, or this concept, I shouldn't say theory, um, it, the way you were describing it is very interesting, that there is no individual thought, that essentially... There's, oh, there's lots the, of individual but thought. it's all but, connected. Right to all the other people that are around you and all the people that you've interacted with and all the places you've been and the things you've seen and all the people 
that are constantly thinking simultaneously around you that you're aware of. And the people that you're trying to influence, because you're trying to influence people all day long. Right. Um, If you want somebody to bring you a sandwich, you have to get across that you want that sandwich. Yeah. And especially if you want somebody like a wife or an assistant to bring you a sandwich, and that's not normally what they do. Right. Then you really have to work hard and influence them. But but the, the universe at least the living part of the universe, and so far we only know of life on this planet, it's all interconnected. Those bacteria I was talking about, they're in your gut. They are making your vitamin B. They are making your vitamin K. They are making an awful lot of the things that you use to survive. They're also making chemicals that influence your mind and your moods. They're manipulating you. So when you go down to the corner store to buy some chocolate eclairs, and you go home and you eat them. In fact, you can only digest a small portion of the chocolate eclair. Those bacterial colonies living in your gut, they do the rest of the digesting for you. So who's really going to the corner store? Who's really the boss? Who's really driving you, the vehicle of transportation? Are these bacteria driving you down to the corner store so that you will feed them the stuff that they love the most? Or Mm. is your will driving you to the corner store? Well, the answer is a little of both. A little of both. Not yeah. as much of both. I mean, there, there's this example of, there's this fungus. And the fungus has a very peculiar lifestyle, and I'm very curious to find out how it got this lifestyle. But it lives half of its life in an ant colony and half of its life in a sheep. So when it comes out of the phase of that it goes through in the ant colony and is ready to go into the sheep, it takes over the brain of an ant. And it gets that ant to climb to the top of a stalk of grass. Why? Because when the sheep come along to graze, they will inhale the ant. What? You're telling me that a fungus can control the mind of an ant in ways that we're just beginning to explore now, this year, and maybe last year a tiny little bit, that it can actually be that precise and how it takes over the controls of that mind. Is this related to one of those, uh, the fungus that gets inside those ants, and the ants are aware of it, so they take the ant away because the ant will explode and spray spores into the air, and it'll affect the infect the Oh, I'm not aware of that one, but it sounds... It's cordyceps. Yeah, it's... Yeah. But it it sounds similar. Yeah. But but the real deal is, okay, life on this earth functions the way that a beehive functions. Mm -hmm. And how does a beehive function? 95% of the bees are conformist bees and they go go out to the hot flower patch of the day and they mine the nectar and they have a public stomach in which they can carry this stuff i mean built into them inside of them and they have these carrying hairs on their thighs and they carry pollen in those and when they arrive at the unloading bay there is an unloading bay in the hive and when they arrive at the unloading bay if the unloaders know that the interior really needs pollen and nectar and they see you carrying that pollen and nectar, they stick their tongues down your throat to check out what's in your public stomach. They go wild with excitement when they discover it's filled with nectar. They check out your thighs, the carrying hairs on your thighs. They go wild when they see that you're carrying pollen. They feel you all over with their antennae. They are intensely excited when they are unloading you, and that gets you excited. You feel like a rock star. Wow. Because this is the same kind of attention a rock star gets. So you go back out to the flower patch of the day and mine some more. Meanwhile, there are these lazy, good-for-nothing bohemian bees. They're anyway from 5% to 20% of the colony. And they don't do a single useful thing at all. And so far as you can see, they don't do anything to earn their keep in the colony. Why? Because they're out doing loop after loop after loop and lazy eights after lazy eights after lazy eights. They'll fly eight miles just following their whims, following their whims. I mean, if you were their mother, what would you say? You're wasting your fucking life, for God's sakes. Okay, eventually you, the conformist bee, start coming back without pollen in your carrying hairs and without nectar in your public stomach because the flower patch, the hot flower patch of the day, has been thoroughly plundered. And when you arrive at the unloading dock of the hive, the unloading bees stick their tongue into your public stomach, empty, sorry. They see your carrying hair is empty. They turn their backs on you so savagely that you feel as if you've been cut dead. 
And it finally, I mean, you can't believe that the old factory is not delivering anymore, and it's not giving you a paycheck, so you keep going back to the same patch over and over again, more slowly each time, until finally you give up, and you literally crawl into the hive. And Thomas Seeley, the guy who's done most of the research on this, calls you an unemployed bee. And you are as depressed as if you were unemployed. How do we know that? Because your body temperature is down and you're crawling instead of walking. And you're begging for food from other bees. Well, you look for something to perk you up. Now, what do humans use? A football game, a movie. Bees use pretty much the same thing. What does that mean? They go to the unloading dock. Out of the 200 lazy, good-for-nothing bohemian bees simply following their instincts, five have come back having found new flower patches and they are dancing and the dancing excites you and they're dancing in competition with each other some will dance 27 seconds some will dance 27 minutes and if you find the dance of one of those dancers sufficiently persuasive it lifts you out of your lethargy gets you excited and you fly out she's giving a little in a little figure eight dance She is giving precise instructions on how to get to the flower patch and what the headwinds are and what the tailwinds are. And you pick up her message, you fly out to the flower patch that she has recommended, and you check it out for yourself. And if you get excited about it, you come back and you start dancing. And ultimately, the bee who gets the greatest number of backup dancers wins. And you all go out, all you conformist bees who are now unemployed, go out to the new hot flower patch of the day, and the same pattern repeats itself. Now, that's a collective mind operating on the basis of 20,000 independent bees. And the, the living world operates in pretty much the same way. Bacteria are using you to get them chocolate eclairs. You are using them to digest chocolate eclairs. They are teasing our scientists into wild activity by threatening to develop illnesses that can bypass all of our antibiotics, which, by the way, are chemical weapons that microorganisms, colonies of microorganisms organisms use to kill entire competing colonies. We stole them from microorganisms. We didn't invent them, antibiotics. So the scientists are very aware of the fact that the bees or, or that the bacteria are getting ahead of us in research and development and are beginning to develop techniques to get around all of our drugs. So they are researching their ass off. So is there any common brain that links the bacteria to the scientific community? You bet, they're competing with each other. And in the process of competing with each other, what are they doing? They are both creating new options for all of life.